Welcome back to Educator.com. This is the first of the lessons on the nervous system, and it's about neurons. So neurons are the basic cell of the nervous system. Your brain alone has 100 billion neurons. And then besides the brain, you've got the spinal cord and all the other nerves. So you've got billions and billions and billions of neurons in your body. And actually, about 25% of your neurons are concentrated in the brain alone. There's a lot going on up there, of course. So there are three basic functions, if we were to summarize. Uh, the first one is sensory reception. Those are the neurons that are on the receiving end of what your body's experiencing outside of your body, outside of your skin. Uh, what your neurons notice within your body, they can sense that and tell your brain. Besides that, you got the other direction, the motor stimulation, going from the brain and spinal cord out. And, and that's going to not only control your muscles, it's going to control glands, it's going to control organs, all kinds of stuff. A any action your body does is basically being controlled by a neuron, and that's motor stimulation. And then process processing, these are the in-between neurons. So when you have a sensory signal going into the uh, central nervous system, you're going to have usually what are called interneurons, the ones that connect the sensory to the motor going back out. And so that's the processing portion. In your cerebral cortex, the outside of your brain, the most uh, superficial layer of your brain, there's a lot of processing going on. And then form equals function. This is true of pretty much any tissue in the body. Whatever it looks like, whatever form the cells take on, that corresponds to whatever function they have. Uh, you're going to see that in the next slide. This neuron is a classic looking neuron. So this is, this is your typical form for a typical function of a neuron. You have up here the receiving end of the neuron, and then you have here the end that is sending the signal along uh, to whatever other cell is beyond it. It could be another neuron, it could be a muscle cell, it could be a sweat gland. So when we look at the basic neuron anatomy, uh, there are a few parts you should keep in mind. The cell body, is this part right up here. The cell body is where you're going to have most of the organelles that you see in a typical cell. This green dot is the nucleus. You're going to see mitochondria, ribosomes, etc. The dendrites look like little tree branches. So here's a dendrite, 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 dendrite. And the little tiny extensions extending beyond it, as in this part, you can call those dendritic branches. So those dendritic branches, they're on the receiving end. You have a signal molecule that docks there, and then that initiates the signal into the neuron as a whole. The axon hillock is basically the connecting portion between the cell body of the neuron and the axon, which is coming up in a bit. So right here, that's a, a thickened portion that connects the cell body and axon. So the axon is this classic long part. Now I'm drawing a purple line through those, those yellow sheaths, which will be mentioned in a sec. But the, the axon is typically long, has to do with sending that electrical signal to some other part of the nervous system. The axolemma on the axon is basically uh, the modified plasma membrane. So if you were to zoom into this part right here, this little purple part right here, that border you can call the axolemma. And lemma actually means uh, sheath. So it is like, uh, or sorry, husk rather. Um, it's like a husk of, a, of a, an ear of corn. It's surrounding that axon. So just remember, lemma means husk. So the axolemma, border of the axon. And then myelin sheaths. So these yellow wrappings, they're made of something called myelin. And myelin is approximately 80% lipid and 20% protein. So mostly fatty uh, when we look at the structure of it. And the nickname for these, at least in the peripheral nervous system, which I'll tell you more about in the future, uh, the nickname for these there is Schwann cells. So each of these is its own separate cell. The orange dot is the nucleus of each Schwann cell and they're made of myelin. Picture that my arm here is a neuron. So here you got the cell body, dendrites with their little dendritic branches. Here's the axon. Imagine that there are socks wrapped around my arm. Kind of a funny image, but the socks wrapped around my forearm here would be those myelin sheaths or Schwann cells. And the, the function of these, 
we'll get into that more in the future. Um, has to do with um, insulation and increasing uh, the speed of the electrical conduction. Nodes of Ranvier. Nodes of Ranvier are right here. They're the parts of the axon that are exposed. So right here, you've got a Schwann cell. It's covering that part of the axon. But in between these two Schwann cells, there's an exposed axon section. That's a node of Ranvier or Ranvier, depending on who you ask. Axon terminals are right in here. Um, Another name I've heard for the endings here is axon buttons, or I even heard someone pronounce them boutons. Uh, but basically it's the ending of the axon, the termination of the axon. So here are these little axon terminals, and you're going to usually have what are called neurotransmitters released from there. If we were to zoom into one of these axon terminals, let's zoom into this one. concentrated at the end here, you're going to see little what are called synaptic vesicles. So synaptic vesicles right there. And inside of the synaptic vesicles are little signaling molecules called neurotransmitters, these little black dots. And what basically happens is when you get electrical signals traveling down the axon, at the end of the axon terminals, these little vesicles are just waiting to be stimulated. And when they're stimulated, they then fuse with the end of that axon button and they end up dumping these little neurotransmitters into the synapse. And they end up traveling to the next neuron or to whatever the neuron is affecting. Maybe it's a muscle. So these synaptic vesicles hold those little neurotransmitters or signal molecules until they're stimulated. And it's usually by calcium, which you're going to hear more about in the future. The synapse is the space. So right where I drew those little black dots, that's the synapse. And the synapse, there's two main varieties. Um, one of them is called an electrical synapse. An ele electrical synapse would be if this is the axon uh, terminal buttons or endings of the axon of one neuron, here's the cell body of the next. If they're physically attached to each other by proteins, there is no space in this synapse. It's just the connection of these two. If this is the one that's sending the signal, they would call this a presynaptic neuron. This one's the postsynaptic neuron. The way that these stimulate each other is just simply electrical signals from the axon of this, from, from what are called action potentials, stimulate this one. That's not as common in the nervous system. What tends to be more common is here's the endings of the axon, here's the cell body of the next one. Usually there is a space between the presynaptic and postsynaptic uh, neurons. And that space, you would actually call that a chemical synapse. And it's a chemical synapse because the chemicals found in it are these neurotransmitters, these little black dots that I mentioned before. Uh, if you were looking at a chemical synapse here, you might see something like this. Here's the cell body of the postsynaptic neuron, little dendritic branches coming out. And you can see that there are little spaces here. That's the synapse. And the amazing thing is some neurons can have thousands and thousands of synapses with neighboring neurons. So if you consider all those different connections, the, the potential for those connections in the brain, you can see how 100 billion neurons can give you a lot of variety in terms of the neural pathways. Because 100 billion neurons times tens of thousands of synapses, it's amazing to think about. And like I said, with form equaling function, the forms of neurons can vary greatly. And here are some examples. This one right here on the far left, this is a classic looking neuron from the cerebellum. If you take slices through the back of the brain, um, you'll hear more about that later in the, in the brain lessons. The cerebellum, when you look at a microscopic level, you have these amazing sets of dendritic branches. I mean, it really looks like a crowded tree with, with tiny little branches all throughout. So this just goes to show you that you can have all kinds of signals uh, coming up to this. I mean, there's so much on the receiving end. Here's the cell body down here, and there's the axon.
This is actually part of the cerebral cortex, the outside of the brain. In a mouse, this is a much simpler, average looking neuron. Here's the cell body, dendrites, axon, and here are those axon terminals. And then looking back at the uh, human brain, uh, this looks like it's from Gray's Anatomy. This is how you're able to smell. Um, odorant molecules or, or smells, odors, would drift up to here, um, stimulate these particular neurons, and then you have a little relay station here. Mitral cells assist in getting those signals into these fibers. So these are extensions of neurons uh, specifically axon portions that are going to come together in an olfactory nerve, which is just a, a giant bundle of all the different axons located up there that allow you to smell. So these are just three examples, and there are a lot more. Neurons can definitely vary in their form based on what function that uh, is needed. All right, action potentials. Action potentials describe how an electrical signal is actually transmitted along a neuron. How does it get from the dendrites of, connected to the cell body down the axon to the axon terminals? How does that happen? Well, it's action potentials. So these are electrical changes along a neuron's membrane that allow signaling to occur. And the two main contributors are Na+, and K+, also known as sodium and potassium. So these are both charged ions, uh, both known as cations or cations, depending on who you ask. Uh, but they're both uh, big players in how this little electrical wave occurs. It's an all or none activity, meaning you can't half stimulate a neuron. You're either stimulating it or you're not. It's at rest or it's actually sending signals. What you can vary is how many signals is it sending in a second. Is it sending 200 signals? Is it sending one or two? So this is uh, a little graph that depicts what happens in an action potential. So typically, the average neuron is at rest when it's negative 70. And, and this is in millivolts, thousandths of a volt. So at negative 70, the neuron is just chilling. And you can see here, there's some fail initiations, meaning there might have been a tiny bit of a signal from a neighboring neuron, maybe a few neurotransmitters that dock, but not enough to get it going. So you could see that it was a little hump, but it didn't go all the way. But once it reaches what's called threshold, that's the, the level where it's going to happen. Once you reach threshold, it's going. Threshold after negative 55, you're going to get what's called depolarization. Depolarization is where it gets much more positive, and you're going to see in the next few slides how that happens. Basically, a lot of sodium, a positively charged ion, enters the cell, and that gets it all the way up to positive 40. Some textbooks say positive 30. So if you're using a textbook uh, to supplement what you're learning from me, please follow along whatever the textbook says, because I've seen textbooks say positive 30. I've seen others say positive 40, as this little graph does. Following depolarization, it goes back down from where it came from, repolarization, and the opposite occurs. Instead of a bunch of positive ions, sodiums, coming into the axon, potassium leaves. And so when that positive ion leaves, brings it back down towards the negative. And enough of it leaves to get it back below what was the original uh, resting potential, goes down to about negative 90, and then comes back up to resting state. And you can see that when you look at the time, this is in milliseconds, thousandths of a second. So in just a few milliseconds is one action potential. Think about how many you could have in just one second time. It's amazing. And like I said, it's, it's an electrical wave. And you'll see that in the next few um, images that I'm going to show you. So a neuron at rest, like I said previously, the average neuron has a potential of about negative 70 millivolts at rest. More negative ions are inside the axon compared with the outside. And the reason why that's important to realize is because that's why it's negative 70. So if you're wondering, what am I drawing here? This is an axon. Now pretend this is an axon without those myelin sheaths. Uh, and, and that exists. There are lots of axons in the nervous system where you're not going to see those wrappings. So it's just going to be uh, just a pure bare axon um, from the cell body over to the terminals. But then in other areas, yeah, you're going to see those wrappings. So let's pretend we're not even looking at those wrappings right now. So this is just the axolemma, axolemma, and these are little proteins. 
um, gated protein channels, which you may have learned about in biology. Um, they involve transport of ions back and forth, um, and usually it's involving ATP, using energy to do that. So when we start off, it's more negatives. I'm just going to draw a bunch of negative signs here on the inside of the axon. So here, this is the intercellular part. And here is extracellular outside. I could draw a few negatives out here because there are going to be negative ions. There are going to be fluoride ions, there are going to be chlorine ions, etc. But definitely a lot more on the inside. And that's how you get the negative 70 millivolts. When we look at the amount of sodium and potassium, you're going to see a lot more uh, sodium relatively outside. Because like I said earlier, the way that you get that initial, that depolarization, it's a lot of sodium coming in. So I'm going to draw a gigantic Na plus here. I'm going to write a tiny Na plus on the inside because, yes, you're going to have some sodium on the inside of the axon, but proportionally, concentration-wise, you're going to have a lot more on the outside. Conversely, there's a lot of potassium K plus on the inside. I'm going to draw a tiny K plus on the outside. Just show you that there is some there, but definitely, this is where they're most abundant when a neuron is at rest, typically. So keep that in mind when we talk about how an action potential is initiated and what happens next. All right, so here are the steps of how you actually get an action potential coming to fruition. Here's going to be our graph that I'm going to be doodling on as we go through this. Now, I know that um, people who are really into math might be bugged by the fact that I'm doing this, but uh, just bear with me. I'm actually going to draw um, negative 70 millivolts above the x-axis. Now normally, of course, negative numbers would be below, but for the sake of this example, it's just a little bit better this way. So our range is going to be pretty much from negative 70 all the way to positive 30. And resting potential is right here. Okay, Here's going to be time in milliseconds. And of course, this is millivolts on the y-axis. So those are our milliseconds. Here is our neuron, specifically the axon. Now this is a three-dimensional structure. We're looking at it in two dimensions here, but the pictures you're going to see uh, that show you how this works are two-dimensional, so bear with me. Threshold reached. Uh, as we looked at before with the cell body, Threshold, all it takes is getting enough of a stimulation to dock at the dendrites uh, to have the electrical signal be initiated in the axon. So that's going to get you up to that negative 55 approximately, and then you're just going to go from there. So imagine that just to the left of this little image here, you've got that axon hillock, you've got the cell body, and there's been enough of signals, neurotransmitters, docking here to get it going. So depolarization, we're going to use red to depict depolarization. And remember, that's via sodium moving inwards from the extracellular space. All right, so that is depolarization in red. That is when you have a whole bunch of sodium going in. And remember, it started out with negative millivoltage on the inside. Once a bunch of positives come in, your net charge is going to be much more positive, and it's going to go until you get to positive 30. And if you're asking, well, what if it only goes to positive 10? It's regulated in a way where it's going to go all the way up to that. It's, it's very predictable how much sodium goes in to get it to that point. Once depolarization finishes, these little sodium channels, once you get up to positive 30, positive 40-ish, they're going to deactivate. They're going to close, and that's going to initiate the, the other one, the potassium ones to open. So let's use blue for the potassium part of it. That's known as repolarization. Repolarization is going to get you all the way down there. And so remember, we have a bunch of potassium on the inside, 
Once all this happens, you get a bunch of that Na plus inside, that's going to trigger a bunch of potassium ions to leave. Another thing to keep in mind is that this is an axon, axon potential for just this part of the axon. So this action potential is going to initiate another action potential, which is going to initiate another action potential. That's why it's good to picture it as an electrical wave. So the electrical wave, it finishes here, and that initiates it on the next one. So once you have repolarization happening here, you're going to start to get that threshold being reached at the next one, and then depolarization comes right after it. So it's nice to think of it as a wave because it happens with this up and down one place, up and down the next place, and so on. Hyperpolarization is when you have slightly more positives leaving the inside of the axon than you really need to have. I mean, by need to have, I mean it goes past the negative 70 millivolts. So it goes down a little further than negative 70, down to about negative 90 or so. And then it evens out again. You get back to resting. So there's a little switcheroo that happens where you get it going back to resting potential so that right, right away it's ready again to be stimulated. And remember, you can have hundreds of action potentials happen in just a second or two. And that's amazing to think about. So once again, resting, depolarization, repolarization, going back down, hyperpolarization, and then back to resting potential. Here's another image that shows us this. So here's the intracellular space. Here's the extracellular space outside. You can see that initially the sodium is coming in. So you can see that these little orange um, hexagons are coming into this little area here that fits them. It's like a little puzzle piece inside of this protein and that dumps them on the inside. If you're wondering, what are these little purple things? Those have to do with ATP, have to do with um, using ATP to power these little protein channels. And of course, the potassium does the exact opposite. Potassium is going to end up leaving. So you can see that these little uh, yellow um, ovals come in here and are dumped out. You see that because of the action potential, you have the increase in um, sodium here and the increase in potassium in the opposite direction. And that's how you get that up and down of depolarization and repolarization. Saltatory conduction, uh, that term comes from a Spanish word that I know of, saltar, means to, to jump. So saltatory conduction is the jumping of an electrical signal along an axon. This happens every second of every day of your life in your body. Anywhere that you have an axon that is covered by Schwann cells, or the other one is oligodendrocytes. So, it's a mouthful. Oligodendrocytes tend to be more in the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, and in some parts of your peripheral nervous system, you have these Schwann cells. So, whether you're in the brain, spinal cord, or the nerves going through all parts of your body, you're going to see these little sheaths, these little coverings around the axon. And think of it this way. If you have those little wrappings, again, like I said before, imagine the socks being wrapped around. What it does is instead of the electrical signal, the action potential is having to go along every little portion of my forearm or of the axon. If I have a wrapping here and a wrapping here and a wrapping here, you have those little nodes, those nodes of Ranvier that I mentioned before. And saltatory conduction literally means that the action potentials jump from node to node. And that speeds up the signal. Another function of these is just insulation. It's, it's a protection and insulating of the axon, but primarily that jumping is going to speed up the electrical signaling. And that's very important. So of course, saltatory conduction, you get that jumping of electrical signal all the way down the axon until you inevitably get to the axon terminals where you have synaptic vesicles waiting. And they're waiting to get that signal to the next neuron or whatever is right after that presynaptic neuron. I love this image because they're showing how an oligodendrocyte covers uh, these axons on some neuron within the central nervous system. And then they're showing you what it looks like on the inside of the axon. It's easy to forget that there's other intracellular things besides just charged particles, besides sodium or potassium in the axon. And here they're showing you, you have a microtubule and microfilament. 
And if you remember from biology, those are important parts of the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton, you're going to still find that in a really specialized modified cell like the neuron. Synapses and neurotransmitters. So like we mentioned before, synapses are the spaces between neurons or a neuron and whatever is after uh, that synapse. Neurotransmitters are the signaling molecules that drift across synapses, and, and that's the case in chemical synapses. Remember, electrical sy synapses is when they're right on each other. But more often than not, you're going to have a tiny little space between the presynaptic and postsynaptic neuron. And this is a great picture for it. Here's that little button at the end of an axon uh, terminal. So one here, that would be axon terminal. Two, this is a modified plasma membrane of a muscle. And we actually call this the sarcolemma. Three, if you remember, three is labeling a synaptic vesicle. If we zoom into that, zoom into three, what would be inside of that little vesicle is tiny little neurotransmitters. And there are a lot of different neurotransmitters in your body. They all have slightly different functions and slightly different roles. In this particular example, we're going to talk about acetylcholine, also abbreviated as ACH. That's a classic abbreviation for acetylcholine. It has uh, very important functions in the central nervous system, but here we're going to talk about the peripheral nervous system. What does it do in your arms, your torso, your legs? When you have this, this nerve coming off your spinal cord and going to a muscle, you're going to have acetylcholine being that initiator. So if you ever wondered what actually makes my muscles contract, acetylcholine is that signal that goes from the neurons to the muscles to actually make it contract. And these little things here, number four, these are receptors that have a perfect fit for acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is like the key that fits into a lock. And number four, without acetylcholine fitting in there, it's not going to stimulate the muscle. Uh, number five is labeling a mitochondrion. And you're going to have lots of them in muscle tissue because you need a lot of energy, a lot of ATP to make muscles function. So how would acetylcholine actually leave a neuron and go to where it's destined and how would it function? Well, here's the answer. If you look at how these neurotransmitters actually function and how they move across a synapse, there's a few steps, four main steps. Number one, action potential depolarizes synaptic knob. So this synaptic knob, I've been calling it axon button, same basic thing. Action potential, you're going to get action potentials happening all the way down the axons to the end here, like a wave of electricity. And then that's going to cause calcium, also labeled as Ca2+, plus, uh, because it is a charged ion. It has a plus 2 charge, unlike uh, sodium and potassium, which have a plus 1 charge. Uh, but calcium is not just in your bones. It's not just for um, giving your bones all that matrix, all that hard stuff that gives them most of their mass. Calcium is also very important for making neurotransmitters drift across a synapse. So once you have that wave of electricity coming down here, it stimulates calcium to move these little synaptic vesicles to the edge. And it causes them to fuse with the edge and dump through exocytosis, their little neurotransmitters, in that synapse. And they just drift across through passive transport. I don't want you to think that ATP is, is somehow forcing them across. The synapse is very, very tiny. So all it takes is just a bunch of diffusion, a bunch of drifting of these little neurotransmitters across. And those little black dots, once again, are going to symbolize the neurotransmitters. And they're going to dock on number four, those little uh, receptors. Next step, ACH binds those receptors on the postsynaptic membrane like I just demonstrated in the previous drawing. So once those little black dots come into contact here, and, and this is definitely um, not doing it justice. You know, you only see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of these little um, proteins receiving the neurotransmitters, there's going to be at least hundreds, probably more like thousands on the average, um, uh, what they call the, the motor end plate, which means you have a motor signal coming to this muscle and you have the reception of that signal there at that end plate. 
So once the ACH binds to those receptors, that acetylcholine is going to initiate muscle contraction. And in future lessons, you're going to learn about how a muscle actually contracts once that signal is received. You got to get rid of this acetylcholine to stop the initiation of the muscle contraction. If acetylcholine stays there, contraction is going to keep happening. You want to get rid of it eventually. And a lot of times there's an enzyme hanging out in here ready to be used when you want to get rid of that signal. So in this case, it's called acetylcholine esterase. That's a mouthful, but acetylcholine esterase actually gets rid of those little black dots gets rid of the acetylcholine. And once that's broken down, signal stops. If you want to get it happening again, dump more acetylcholine out of that um, little synaptic knob or that axon button. And that's how neurotransmitters function across the synapse. Now, when it comes to one neuron stimulating another, and it has a lot to do with inhibition versus excitation. So inhibition is the, is the turning off of a signal. It's making a neuron kind of stop doing what it's meant to do. And excitation is the exact opposite. It makes those action potentials happen more and more and more. So neurotransmitters, some of them can do both depending on where they're located. Some neurotransmitters are only inhibitory. Others are only excitatory. The sum of two or more neurotransmitters in an area dictates the result. Here's an example of that. We're going to talk about presynaptic inhibition first. So let's say this is a presynaptic neuron that's going to stimulate this neuron here. So this would be called a postsynaptic neuron. And it's going to have little dendritic branches. They're going to increase the reception of a signal. And here's the synapse once again. Well, what you can actually have here is another neuron off to the side that can affect whether or not this presynaptic neuron is actually going to send its signal across. So let's say um, you've got action potentials going along here, and all you need is calcium to make these little synaptic vesicles actually dump their neurotransmitters across. Well, you can have this particular neuron send signals here to turn off this process. So if you have the ability here for these neurotransmitters to prevent calcium from making these fuse and do exocytosis, that's called inhibition. So then you're not going to get neurotransmitters, at least not a significant amount of them, docking here on the postsynaptic neuron. And that means you're kind of turning off the ability of this neuron to effectively stimulate this one. So that's inhibition. The opposite can be true. You can actually have presynaptic facilitation, which is a form of exciting this particular uh, neuron. So the opposite could happen. We could have a lot of neurotransmitters coming from this particular um, synaptic knob or, or axon button, making this get stimulated and actually causing these synaptic vesicles to fuse, thereby dumping the little neurotransmitters here and docking on these little proteins on the receiving end. And that would actually cause the electrical stimulation and the uh, action potentials to carry along this particular neuron. And so you have both sides of those, and it's, and it's a summation. If I had one little neuron here and one little neuron down here, and this one is producing an inhibitory effect, and this one's pr producing an excitatory uh, or facilitating kind of effect, whichever one is doing more is going to win. Uh, if you have significantly more inhibition coming from here than the excitation from here, chances are this particular neuron is not going to be throwing enough neurotransmitters over here to initiate action potentials. And here are some examples of neurotransmitters. There are a lot of different neurotransmitters in the nervous system. These are some of the main ones. Norepinephrine, also known as noradrenaline, and you also have epinephrine, known as adrenaline. This is a very very common neurotransmitter that you're going to see in the nervous system. It's typically excitatory, more often than not, and it's similar to how ACH is 
in the nervous system. Remember, ACH stimulates muscles to contract. Norepinephrine does a lot in the brain to stimulate neural pathways. Dopamine, depending on where it is and, and what part of the brain it's in, it can be excitatory or inhibitory. And here are two examples of that. So in terms of how it's inhibitory, in some region, regions, it prevents overstimulation of muscle. It prevents you from actually doing too much muscular contraction when you're not supposed to. So when I lay my arms down here on this table, I have actually uh, contracted my triceps brachii to bring my arms down like this. And I've stopped my biceps brachii, brachii from uh, contracting. They're, they're more relaxed. If I didn't have dopamine working with my, uh, my nerves that are going to my arms, I could actually have a shaking going on. And a lot of research into Parkinson's disease has verified that dopamine plays a role. If you don't have dopamine in certain parts of the brain working effectively, you can have a shaking going on where that person doesn't have as much control as they used to in terms of extending an arm in a particular way and bringing it back in when they want to. So that dopamine imbalance has something to do with Parkinson's. In other regions, dopamine can actually give the brain a sense of reward. This would be on the excitatory side. So in other parts of the brain that don't have to do with muscle control per se, the, the times that you feel most proud of something you've done and, and that kind of natural high you get from accomplishing something, thank dopamine. And you can have times where a drug can give your brain the illusion of having a lot more dopamine inside of uh, the brain. And that's how cocaine works. Uh, so cocaine, that particular drug, when it's snorted, the chemical going into your brain actually um, is called a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. And what that means is it keeps dopamine in the synapses much longer than it's supposed to. Because if you don't get rid of dopamine, it's going to keep making those neural pathways be activated. Like I said before, if you get rid of a neurotransmitter, like with uh, acetylcholine esterase breaking down acetylcholine, that's one way you can get rid of it. But you can also suck them back up. That's called reuptake. If you get, for instance, dopamine back in the neurons where it's supposed to be when you want to stop that signaling, that's one way to stop it. But something like cocaine is going to prevent the reuptake of it. It's going to keep dopamine around longer and kind of give you an artificial sense of happiness or pride or, or having a really great feeling. And that's part of the high of cocaine. There are, of course, a lot of negative aspects to doing that. Serotonin, that tends to be an excitatory one. And this affects attention and emotion. There are a lot of uh, antidepressant drugs that act upon serotonin. Um, if you're having a serotonin imbalance, maybe not enough uh, being let go into your brain or, or too much, that can affect your uh, ability to have your attention focused on something and it can affect your mood. Endorphins. Endorphins are those natural neurotransmitters that inhibit pain. So when I broke my collarbone in high school, there was a period of time right after breaking it, I did not feel any pain and they call that shock. I was walking around for 20 or 30 minutes with this numbness and my brain was attempting to sort of protect me from feeling all that intense pain from this bone being fractured. And, and yes, it eventually wore off and, and I felt the pain later. Endorphins also are interesting when you talk about opiates, opiates being uh, a class of drugs, opium, morphine, heroin. These drugs, if you look at the active ingredient, it kind of mimics the shape of endorphins. So if you ever wondered, how does morphine make someone in the hospital feel like they're on cloud nine? Well, how it happens is if endorphins are the natural neurotransmitters that are supposed to kind of make you feel like you don't have pain, somebody who's just had a really intense surgery, uh, somebody who's a burn victim, somebody who's an AIDS patient who may be going through a lot of pain, you want to give them more endorphins than their body's willing to kind of dish out. So having a drip of morphine intravenously, that morphine going up into the brain, it's like the brain having way more endorphins than it naturally does have. And so, yeah, you're going to prevent that person from experiencing all the pain they would have experienced otherwise. Now, somebody who is completely healthy and in no need of morphine, they can get easily addicted to it. Because the more you introduce morphine into your system, 
the more the cells in your brain will actually make little receptors to respond to that additional morphine. And that's how addiction eventually builds and builds and builds. And with addiction, you're going to get withdrawal symptoms if you all of a sudden stop introducing that morphine into your body. Drugs are, are not something you want to play with. Um, stick with your natural supplies of neurotransmitters whenever possible. Thanks for watching Educator.com.